Good morning, everyone. Hello, welcome Hi. to the Weave Lab Day. Um, today's Lab Day is actually our final Lab Day in the Capacity Building Lab Day series. Um, so a bit of a bittersweet moment for us um, at the Weave uh, team. Um, but I'm really so excited and honored and happy that we could invite and have our Friends, Families and Travelers Lab Day on Crystal's Vardo. Um, we have a lovely mix of um, uh, actors, musicians, uh, actresses, the director, um, and also we'll be looking at the material for, that was the teacher's material that was produced. We'll look at some clips. So a real range of material um, and items that we get to um, unpack, but also ask uh, the key people from the, the work, the theater production, questions, learn about their experiences, um, and get real insight into how historical material, historical situations were reused or brought into and woven into this creative production that has had a, a quite a long history and gone through several um, iterations. And I know Susanna will, will kind of help us understand a little bit more about that. But before we get into that side of the lab day, I do have a, a few kind of housekeeping things um, that we'll go through. Um, so yes, I'm Rosa Cisneros. I'm from Coventry University, the Center for Dance Research. I'm part of the Weave team, which is a European and funded project. We'll learn a little bit about that, uh, about the project and the capacity building strand of things from our colleague Fred Troyan, who has sent us a video in a few minutes. Um, for those who would like an audio description, I am a female sitting in a cream colored chair. My long black hair is down. I have olive skin tone. I'm wearing long silver um, earrings. I have dark eyes um, and I'm wearing a bit of um, lip gloss that is giving me some red lips um, and I'm sitting in front of a burgundy wall. Um, as always, our lab days are a very safe and brave space where we ask people to challenge each other, to ask questions, maybe might be clumsy questions, but that is the, the point that we can really um, ask each other and learn from each other and share our experiences. Um, however, having to, you know, when we do that, I do ask that we respect each other's um, opinions, respect that all of us are situated and coming from very different perspectives but hopefully we can still um, come together and really um, learn from each other and celebrate each other and you know see how art and culture and cultural heritage really um, can help us transform uh, several spaces. Um, having uh, Also I'd like to thank a number of people who are in the space but also behind the scenes um, we are tweeting we are using social media we are using the chat space um, so please do use that space say hello say where you're from if you want to share your contact details feel free to use that to comment and i will bring that into the conversation um, as and when uh, the, as the day goes on um, also if you have any questions or if you you know need to get in touch you can contact Kozer or myself as part of the weave team and we will um try and 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 you know support as we can uh finally this is re a recorded lab day this is the last one so it will go online um so we are mindful of that um but yes again this is a very um exciting lab day and without further ado i would like to ask um, everyone if they could just introduce themselves a minute or so who they are where they're kind of beaming in from today so maybe we start with Susanna just a quick introduction hi there everyone um, my name is Susanna and um, I work for friends families and travelers and I've been friends families and travelers about 14 years now and um, I, um, I'm here in the capacity of um, right, having written Crystal's Vardo, which is what we're going to explore today, and uh, also directed the play. Um, so, yep, and I, I work on an educational and anti-bullying project at Friends, Families and Travellers, so Crystal's Vardo is, is part of that. So, that's me. Thank you, Susanna. Sarah-Jane? 
Hi, hello. Um, my name is Sarah Jane. Hi, everyone. I haven't seen you for a while. Um, and um, <laughs> hello. Uh, I'm in London at the minute, um, in South London. Um, uh, it's not where I'm from, but I've lived here the past 10 years. Uh, I'm a musician uh, and I do educational work with teaching um, music as well as uh, playing in a Kaylee band and working on different projects like uh, in the past with uh, Romney Theatre Company and um, different things of my own and other musical things and at the moment I've been working also with Crystal Svardo doing some music and working on some educational resources. Fantastic and maybe Kavana. Hi, um, my name's Kavana. Thank you for having me today. Um, I play Crystal in Crystal's Vardo. Um, yeah, I'm here in Surrey today. Um, I'm an actress and Crystal is one of my favourite um, shows that I do. Um, so yeah, being an Irish traveller myself, it's really important to me and it's very close to my heart. So yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you. And last but not least, Stuart. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, I'm Stuart. I'm an actor that lives in Portslade, just down the coast in Brighton. Uh, I've been involved with Crystal's Vado for eight years. Uh, it's been such a wonderful journey. I mean, literally, I mean, we go all over the place, of course, and uh, I get to play loads of characters, which from an actor's point of view is a wonderful challenge. And especially with the pace of the show, as you've seen, it's a fast paced show, but also has these lovely moments of stillness. And I've just met so many wonderful people on this tour, uh, on this journey as well. So it's it's been wonderful and I'm looking forward to, you know, doing more, always. Thank you. Thank you. And so before we get into kind of the meaty and juicy bits about the work, I will um, invite my colleague Fred Troyan, who will frame a bit this capacity building Lab Day series, which is um, we've been doing these. So the first strand was the Lab Day series, which we did in the autumn, looking at bringing people together from different perspectives on looking at either a question, attention, and trying to understand, and that was feeding into the process project. And then the second series, which started from January to well, May, um, is looking at how and what people and institutions and cultural heritage and schools and a lot of our key stakeholders, what um, things they might actually, what tools they might actually use, what they can take away. So what could that next step be? And so, you know, the resources that all of you have produced um, are, are really great examples of, you know, materials that are working with the community, that are co-created with the community and that are in a number of spaces and have been for some time. So there's a real longevity there that um, and know-how that you guys and expertise that you guys have. And so so that's for us within the project, we really wanted to showcase that, um, that this isn't just a moment, um, but you guys have been doing and creating materials for a very long time. Um, so Koza, if we could have Fred's video, please. Hello, um, welcome to this uh, brief lab day. Um, I am Fred Tryon from Leuven University. And uh, together with the partners uh, in WEAF, uh, WEAF stands for Wide and European Access to Cultural Communities through European. We are preparing for you uh, a series of capacity building uh, workshops uh, as a second round in lab days that we do to uh, foster understanding and innovation in the way uh, minority content is represented in heritage collections and in particular how this shows in Europeana. As you know, Europeana is the European portal to uh, contents of heritage institutions and uh, when you aggregate this uh, content and bring them together from diff uh, different sources, it strikes how the 
contents have been described from particular points of view. And this poses a special problem uh, for minorities uh, in Europe. Uh, minorities such as, for, for example, the Roma, Romani people, uh, notice that they have been documented in these official collections essentially as foreigners, as people with another culture that is not the mainstream culture of the institutions that hold uh, these collections and are now in the process of bringing those online. And so the idea of our lab days is in the first place to get an understanding of what the real diversity of perspectives in cultural practices really is. And secondly, to derive the, from that insights in how we could um, teach institution professionals to uh, better the way they add descriptions to their contents and they select and curate these contents. Often these contents have been selected from an external point of view and not from an interest in the symbolic value and the cultural meaning of what the cultural practice is that is documented. And so what we want to offer is uh, insights that we can use to train professionals in the sector. This could be catalographers, archivists, curators, uh, audience developers, to make sure that they see where in the digitization and the description process they can intervene to come to better contents and also how in uh, organizing uh, user engagement activities uh, they can take these perspectives into account. Uh, and this involves both more technical issues such as metadata management as indeed um, curational policies, uh, selection criteria, ways of uh, user empowerment and engagement. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for your presence uh, today and I hope you enjoy this uh, session. Yeah, so you heard uh, my colleague Fred talk about Europeana and content and meta metadata and language that's used when we, you know, um, add material to different spaces like Europeana, which is a digital library. Um, and that's another strand of the of the project that we've been looking at. How do we, what exists in libraries now? Um, where are those questions? Is it actually representative of the work of the communities? And if not, how how can we fix that? How can we challenge it? How can we maybe make that information a bit more accurate and representative of the actual communities? And so um, throughout our um, uh, process and throughout our project, we've been collecting data. And I know I sat down with a few of you and invited you to the Yellow Couch Convos podcast series to help add to Europeana's um, material. Um, so I know uh, Sarah Jane, you and I sat down, Susanna, we sat down. So again, it's looking at how we continue to make sure that these spaces have um, community members or, you know, artists and directors that are, you know, doing the work in a respectful way and making sure that um, the representation is actually, um, yeah, re representative of the communities. So, so I think now we can move into the the um, Crystals Vardo. So Susanna, maybe you want to frame a little bit Crystals Vardo, the history of it, um, and how it came to be. So I think we have a PowerPoint that Kozer will run, and yes. <clears throat> right, morning everybody. Um, yeah, so as I said, I work for Friends, Families and Travellers, and um, I've run a project called Crystals Vardo, and um, 
I'll just tell you a little bit about, <clears throat> um, I don't know um, if any of you know about of the organisation Friends, Families and Travellers. We're actually, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, we're actually a, a national charity uh, based in Brighton. So we work on behalf of all gypsies, travellers and, and Roma, regardless of ethnicity, cultural background. Um, we provide a national helpline service to support community members. Uh, we provide an outreach service in East and West Sussex, because that's, that's where we're based. We also deliver gypsy and traveller uh, cultural awareness training. We are the secretariat for the all-party all parliamentary group on gypsies, traveller and Roma and um, Gypsy, Roma and Traveller member organisation of the VCSE Health and Wellbeing Alliance as a strategic partner to the Department of Health, the NHS and the PHE. Um, we also do a lot of education work, um, working with the Anti-Bullying Alliance. Um, and um, that will now lead me on to uh, the pro my project, uh, Crystal Vardo. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so Crystal Zvado is a play that was first developed and performed in 2012. So um, as we're now in 2022, that actually means that this year it's our 10th anniversary. I think when uh, when the when the, the play was first performed um, in Brighton 10 years ago, I didn't actually anticipate uh, the, the longevity of the project. So um, it's it's really great that it's, it's carrying on. Um, so since, since it was first performed, it's gone on to uh, perform to over 12,000 children, young people and adults. It's the story of a young Romani Gypsy girl's journey through her heritage. And like so many other um, young people from the traveling communities, Crystal's been a, a victim of racist bullying at school. So it was created to provide an engaging and positive tool to address bullying in schools, Gypsy Roma traveler children and young people raise awareness and also celebrate the incredibly rich histories and the culture of the Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities and to, to highlight so many of the issues faced by, by um, young Gypsy, Roma and Travellers. Um, so if I could have the next slide please, Hosa. Thank you. Um, I'm just, just putting some statistics out here. Um, I mean, many of you here probably know about the, um, you know, that the, the the high numbers of discrimination um, that um, young people do, do experience in school. Um, in 2017, the traveller movement found that 70%, that's uh, 138 out of 199 interviews of Gypsy, Roma and traveller children had experienced discrimination in some form um, in education. Um, later on in 2019, friends, families and travellers asked Gypsy, Roma and Traveller young people about the biggest challenges they faced in school and 86% of the pupils reported the biggest challenge was bullying followed by racism at 72%. So these are, are really, um, really high numbers and I think probably um, they're even high, higher. So if I could have the next um, um, slide please. So Crystal's one of many young travellers who experience racist bullying at school. And for this reason, many don't continue into secondary education. So, I mean, I think bullying is probably cited as, as one of the main reasons why, why um, many young people don't continue into their education. And also, you know, parents have, have, um, have, have parental experience in school. Um, where they have also experienced experienced bullying, as, as meant they've often been reluctant to um, to send their their children into into secondary education. So I think a pri the primary primary aged uh, young people are a lot more sort of giving, and and I think once you get into the secondary um, stream, it's 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 a much sort of harsher environment. So um, really, it was it was through. Through the work that's happening at Friends, Families and Travellers, um, the bullying and the discrimination in school that really gave rise to the idea to, to write a play, to, for, for me to write Crystal Vardo. Um, I mean, my, my background is actually in theatre and um, I know the, you know, the, the power of, 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 of theatre <clears throat> in being able to, you know, being a, a great tool to, to 
to um, change hearts and minds, which is kind of what you need to do. And education and raising awareness about the many issues um, is, is, is so important. So Crystal Zardo sort of weaves the histories and the culture of the Gypsy Roma traveler community in, into one story as much as is possible um, in the space of an hour. Um, so, um, so the aim of the play is to raise awareness of the persecution of Gypsy Roma and traveler communities through the centuries, but to reflect on the ways that this then manifests in anti-Gypsyism today. Um, so I think it, it's so important to, to sort of, to understand the history and to, to um, to give people the context by, by sort of presenting um, the the persecution and the and the sort of the 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 way that it's um, history just keeps on repeating itself, but nothing is changing, and we're we're, we're you know we're still where we are today. Um, so the play was originally written for young people, age seven and above, for schools, but over the years we've actually expanded this audience and we, we now go into prisons, public sector organizations, festivals, theaters, museums, and libraries. And um, if you can see the picture on the screen, um, that, was, that was actually a performance that we did um, last year in a priory in, um, in Gloucester, which was to, um, to um, police the NHS workers. So it was kind of almost like a sort of a, a training so you know it's it's great that we've, we've extended that audience it's not just young people but you know it's an important story that we want to get out there and you know everybody can learn from that um could i have the next slide please so um so we work with performers and artists right across the gypsy roma and traveler communities um, but also the settled community as well. So, you know, we're working all together, bringing all skills in, into the space. Um, the play has evolved over the years as we continue to bring in the new artists, breathe new life into the project and to keep it relevant um, and engaging. So, you know, we've been, it's been going for 10 years and I think that the, the actors will, will tell you that um, I think we probably, I can't even think of how many different versions we've got of the script. Um, so we're constantly updating and and always really keen to to, um, to get other people, you know, to to um, to respond to people's feedback. And if you know someone comes to us and says, "Oh, I'm not sure if that's right," or maybe you should include this, or or you know, so we really want to kind of like take all that on board and and sort of you know, so the play can can evolve. So we've got, as you can see, uh, just a little bit about the pictures you can see on the screen. We've got our um, uh, dance rehearsal going on here um, during the lockdown so we had we all had to keep sort of socially distanced and we had Rosa um, um, choreographing from, from a laptop um, in front of the actors um, and then we've got um, this is our old Vardo which is being so every time we, we take the Vardo into school um, or into a in, into a venue, we have to build it. This will sort of give and gives you an idea there with the shell. But also um, with our new Vardo, you can see some of the, sort of the intricacy of the of the scroll work. So we, we want to keep everything really sort of vibrant and authentic to sort of really give you know a, a, a really sort of full experience. Can I have the um, the next screen, please? I'm just going to shut my door. Um, so Crystal's journey. So I think you know it's it's important that uh, well crystals of um, you know she's a young girl that um, young people and and anybody can can identify with so that um, you know she's just an ordinary girl like um, anyone else you know with the same sort of hopes and dreams and um, so the audience empathise with her and they they join her, join her on a voyage of discovery through the play um, on her. Uh, Time traveling Vardo, uh, starting out in northern India, across Europe to the shores of England, and, and eventually uh, to a place where, where Crystal sees there's hope for a, for a better future. Because I think it's really important um, to sort of end the play on a positive note to give hope. Because as I say, history has repeated itself so much, and that you know we need to see that um, that you know if we all come together and and, and educate people that you know that we can we can bring about change. Um, next screen, please. 
So I'm just going to show you a few photos from the um, from the play. Um, you might recognise this character as uh, Henry VIII, and uh, also the actor playing Henry VIII. So you know, Crystal goes. Um, the, the play, as I said, starts in northern India. We go into Tudor England. Uh, Henry VIII passed many uh, anti-gypsy laws against, or um, the first anti-gypsy laws in, in, in this country to uh, expel um, gypsies from the country. And, um, and well, um, to, to actually, to, to, um, to kill them if, if, they, if they didn't sort of give up their, their um, being a gypsy, um, their gypsy ways, as it was said. Um, so next screen, please. And um, this is just a scene um, which you will actually see a little bit from later. Um, a, a character called Matthias Cooper, who is um, Queen Victoria's rat catcher. Um, and he was also um, an expert in, in step dancing as well. But um, Queen Victoria was very fond of um, Matty Cooper and really sort of had uh, looked after his family. And it's, it's a life story. Um, next screen, please. And uh, then we have, um, we try to, um, and it's quite difficult because, well, I mean, Crystal's journey is, is one through Romany history and there are so many, um, there are different, you know, different, tra different travellers in, in, in England. We have a number of Irish travellers, um, Scottish travellers, Welsh travellers. So we, we sort of try to, to just sort of give a little bit of a, a um, little hint of, of some of the, the history there with the, with the Irish traveller community. Uh, next screen, please. And then um, this, is a, this is bringing up to date an, an eviction scene. Next screen, please. And then uh, it's just a, I think a ni nice photo of a Crystal, another young girl um, who played Crystal. No, that, that's okay. Next screen, it's fine. Um, so we've had some really, um, really excellent uh, feedback uh, from the play, and this is something that a young Romani gypsy girl said herself. Um, I think that Crystal's Vado is a, a uniquely presented, rarely seen representation of performance of Romani history and heritage, and is as close to factual as it is possible to be. It is given from a point of view which is rarely given, that of the child being bullied. And it's good for children and adults to watch because it shows them how it feels to be that kid. So I think that kind of sums it up in a nutshell, really. Um, and but also, as Ruby said, it's as close um, as close to factual as it is possible to be. Um, it's um, particularly in the sort of like there's an awful, awful lot of, of um, history, um, traveller history has not been documented as no, it's, it's very much a sort of oral history. Um, so, and also sort of like the early history, um, which which hasn't been documented at all. But but we but we know from the from the Sanskrit language that uh, um, that um, Romani Romani Gypsy has originated from from the sort of northern India and then um, and then went on their journey in into um, into the West and into Europe. Um, next screen, please. So we've also had a very, very positive response uh, from teachers. Um, when asked, 58% of teachers said they knew little or nothing about Gypsy, Roma and Traveller histories before seeing the play. And 89% said that their knowledge had increased after seeing the play. And 86% said that the play could effectively deal with bullying. So um, that's, that's a, a really positive response. If I could have the, um, the next screen, please. Um, so there have been many, many sort of very positive outcomes from the play. And um, young people from the settled communities have said that um, it's given them a greater understanding of the issues that their uh, Gypsy Roman traveller peers face, as well as giving them more insight into their culture. And so becoming more aware of the racist language and to challenge it. I think many young people, uh, or many people aren't aware that, um, um, that, Romani Gypsy is, is um, it's, it's an ethnicity 
and that um, you know some of the very derogatory language that is is often used is is actually um, racist. So we do highlight that in the play. So that is and and also the impact that it has on the um, the protagonist uh, Crystal. Um, some teachers have, have said that before seeing the play that they've not included, I mean, I think very few schools do include uh, the Roma and Sinti in Holocaust teaching. So I think, again, that's something that we do highlight in the play. Um, that is a very, that's, that's a significant part of the history. And that many teachers have said that that is something that they would then include in, in, in the history that they teach. Um, Gypsy, this, uh, Gypsy Roman traveller children and young people finding the confidence to speak up about their heritage during the Q&A after the performance. And some children sometimes for the first time have self-identified. So we have had, um, you know, literally um, during the, the kids have watched the play, then we have Q&A and some kids have actually um, put their hands up and said, I'm a traveller. You know, my granddad's got a bardo like that. Or, or they wanted to sort of share experiences with Crystal on the stage. So, so and, and the teachers have come to us afterwards and said, you know, that's the first time they've actually sort of had the confidence to stand up and say, and, and sort of say who they are. I think it's really important to raise awareness in all schools, regardless of whether there are Gypsy Traveller and uh, Gypsy Roma Traveller on roll, to enable them to, to um, provide a broader and more positive education to their pupils. The challenge sort of prejudice generally against Gypsy Roma and Travellers in the wider community and I think it's fair to say that many schools may not know that they have Gypsy, Roma and Traveller children in school, as often parents are reluctant to self subscribe due to fear of discrimination. Um, so I think schools need to be aware of that, that, you know, um, in England, one in 200 people have, are from the Gypsy, Roma, Traveller community. Um, so it's, it's very possible that they will have uh, a traveller or some travellers in their school. Um, next slide, please. I hope I'm not going on too long, Rosa. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our, <laughs> our uh, digital theatre film. So we have the play Crystal Spardo, the live performance. And um, if I could have the next slide. Um, so during the COVID pandemic, we were unable to deliver any, unable to deliver any live performances of the play. And so we used this opportunity to develop a film version. So we're lucky to be able to come together to do this last summer, although there were still restrictions. It gave us the opportunity to work with new artists to enhance the experience and give more authenticity. So we worked with both uh, Rosa Cisneros and Sarah Jane, um, so it made very significant contributions with the music and dance, and I think that really enriched the film. Um, so I'd just like to take this opportunity, just because I, I feel that I'm probably talking too much. Um, I've just, Rosa, could we just show the, li the little dance section? So um, this is the dance that Rosa choreographed, um, which is in the film with the actors. So we're just gonna, it's just a minute long. So we could just watch that for a moment. Is that in the longer film? That's in the short version. It's, it should just say dance. I can carry on and we can watch later if that's easier. Um, let me... Because I might have just sprung that on you. And no problem. I think it's this one. Or is it? Hang on. Yeah. Is it this one? I'm just wondering. It was part of the, it, it was part of the Mary Squires one. It may even be in the Mary Squires. Okay. I'll look for that. I wish I could see there. Yes. And then it came up as a two because i'm thinking i'm think i'm wondering if the dance resource it says oh no that's the music isn't it um i know that in the um we lost in the file that i sent pardon um so i have the that's the music. That's the music. Um, the dance the dance resource, I think, is you, isn't it, Rosa? Yeah. It was it, it was in the it, it, I think it had the title of Mary Squires, but there should be two in there. And one of them had the dance. But don't worry. If it's okay. not there, um, it's 
I'll see. I'll I'll look and see if I if it's. If not, yeah. we need to play a little bit from the film. Um, because it was around. Hang on a minute. I would say around seven in the film. Okay. Okay. We don't know how long this journey is going to take, but on the way, do you mind if I tell you a story? The story of my ancestors. Hang on. Now, we'll need to go back a long way to the year 420 AD. I think that may be taking us a little too... Now, uh, Mar a bit too far back, Rosa. Is it here? This is seven minutes and 32 seconds. Ah, I'm wondering, that's strange. Okay, so I've got 0652. Okay, maybe we should just, we should just move on. I'm just worried about, I'm just concerned for time. Oh, I think it's... Let's dance then! Yes. Music! Uh Rosa, can you switch screens so that we can yeah, see? I can't video? see. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Let's try that again. Uh, you might have to do a new share. Yeah. Okay. I'll start that again. Seconds, nearly there. Is that okay? No. I can still just see the um, desktop bit. Okay. I don't so. know. Hmm. Okay. Now, yes. Yeah. yes. Yes. <laughs> you trust these things, and then, <laughs> all right. Okay, lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. I'll come back if I could come back to the um, um, the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so just going to show you a few more pictures. From, so yeah, just if you could just slowly go through the pictures, then uh, Koiza, that would be great. So the dance that you've just witnessed, and uh, we have an amazing, lovely fight scene in the play, which is choreographed by. And then we go into the 18th century, and this is a lovely lady called Teresa Pine, who's a Romani gypsy. Who um, she's an, an actor who we worked with for the first time. 
Um, so it was great, um, really, in the film, because we were able to work with more performers, because we're, we're restricted in the, um, in the live performance, in that we, we can only work with three, three actors, just because of the sort of logistics and, and cost but in the film. We, were able, we, we had six performers in the play, which was great. Sort of gave it a lot more kind of flavour. Um, Queen Victoria. And back to the eviction scene. Henry VIII again. And Crystal. Yeah, I want to just wanted to share this uh, letter with you. Um, this was um, this was a letter that we received last summer from a, a young girl who'd uh, who'd watched the play. Um, so if you'd, I'm just going to read it to you because it, it really sort of touched touched my heart and um, I think really maybe you know realised the the significance and the importance of the work. So before I, dear Crystal, um, before I watched your play, I didn't know about Gypsy Life. My favourite bit was when you met yourself in the future. Now I've given a spoiler away there. It was really funny because you said the same things. My opinion on gypsies has changed because I thought they were bad people. But seeing your play made me think it is racism. What happened to the girl behind the haystack? Do you have a house in real life? After watching the play, we decorated and coloured our own Vardo. Does your granddad really have a Vardo? Where do you live? So I thought that that was, you know, but, um, obviously, um, you know, it's a, a negative as well in the, the, um, of what the young girl was talking about um, with the way she had previously felt about um, gypsies. But, um, you know, it was great that the play had, had sort of had that significant change in her, in, in what she felt. So that just shows, you know, how important education is. Um, so we have so we have lots of resources um, with the play. So we've got our um, teachers pack, which Rosa, could you just um, share the uh, the teachers pack? So this, so um, so this is what we send out to schools. Um, so there's some sort of preparatory work for the schools to do before seeing the play, um, and. Uh, and then we're also we're also working on new resources as well, which we'll tell you a little bit about more about later. So we'll just run through this. It's just a, and then you probably saw in the in the picture there. There's this really beautiful display of Vardos, which um, a school in um, in in Scotland had had uh, had coloured in and, and decorated. So uh, it's just to give you a little little taste, really. But if if anybody wants a copy of this or um, or I can I can send you a downloadable copy or a hard copy. Then then just just um, put a note in the chat. So I think it's it's really um, really important. I think and it really helps kind of enhance the whole experience um, to have have the teaching materials and to do that that preparatory work. So, um, Sort of get, gain an understanding before seeing the play, and also we have quite a lot. There's quite a lot of audience interaction, so it's nice if the young people can learn the songs beforehand. Um, I won't. Uh, it's 22 pages long, Rosa. So I think it's it's probably just fine. Um, we can always we can always share that with with people after. So um, and that's kind of it in a nutshell, really. So I just want to. Don't really want to carry on. Uh, I think I should, should let other people in the space speak now. Yes, thank you, Susanna, for framing the work, um, for sharing the history of the work. And one of the things that really stood out to me was you said, um, as people watch the piece, you also change things to respond to the feedback you were getting, which I think is quite um, important and also shows um, you know the 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 willingness of you the team FFT to really continue to try and be inclusive and you know be representative and create work and continue to create work that is um, evolving and 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 
including the voices from the community. Um, so I think that, you know, that's really important. I'm sure that that's exhausting to constantly have different scripts. Also, we can hear, I know, Stuart, you said in your introduction um, that you've been part of the work for eight years or more. So um, maybe this is a moment to bring you into the conversation and to get a little bit of your experience um, and to bring others in as well as to what it's been like to be part of this work, um, the really important work. And when you hear some of that feedback, what does that do? How do you feel? Oh, it's, 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 it's great. I mean, when I came to this show eight years ago, I, I I had no uh, clue about much to do with Romani gypsy um, heritage, heritage or, or history of the, of the people. But um, the beauty of being an actor, of course, you, you, you find yourself finding out about things because obviously you have to because you're playing these characters, but it's also fascinating. So it's, it's a wonderful job acting because, you know, here I am eight years later, I've learned a lot and uh, I've met a lot of people within the community. Uh, I've toured this show to so many varied places, um, conferences, libraries, prisons, schools, etc. loads of different places, farms outside it last year in the open air, um, in the mud, uh, which was great. Um, and I've, as I say, from a, you know, when we um, take the show to schools, especially primary schools, uh, it's just wonderful because we get some wonderful questions asked from the children. Um, and it's it's because I, I I was bullied at school years ago for being gay and uh, I didn't know I was gay then. But, um, you know, and it's that was another, you know, kind of um, small community which, you know, was uh, uh, getting bullied and stuff. So it's it's it kind of uh, appealed to me as well because of the bullying aspect, you know, because it's like nobody should be bullied for who they are. And uh, I stand there now as a, you know, proud gay man, a, a proud actor, being able to, you know, uh, educate um, through um, theatre to children and obviously adults as well. So it, it does uh, appeal to me in many ways, this show. Thank you, Stuart. And I think, Kavana, you are the crystal. So maybe we should hear from you and your experience of playing crystal um, and being, you know, you said earlier, an Irish traveler. And so, um, yeah, so over to you, please. Yeah, so I've been playing crystal on and off since it started. So for about 10 years, um, I've always been so passionate about acting and when I left college, I was studying acting at college. There was an opportunity to audition for Crystal's Vardo. And of course, it really appealed to me as well because I am an Irish traveller myself. My dad's an Irish traveller. So I thought it was, would be such a great opportunity to be able to be part of the show. And I've learned so much from the show, even though I am a traveller myself. I've learned so much, so much about the history yeah, like there's so much I've learned and I think it's so good that we are, that like this show exists um, to spread awareness and tell the story of Crystal really um, and show the discrimination throughout the centuries and the years. Like it is such a, like a real amazing show and the feedback we've had from the children and anyone that watches it, the staff, um, has always been mostly positive feedback um, and they you know they really relate to Crystal and um, they think she's cool and um, yeah like Susanna was saying earlier children have just been like proud to say I'm a traveller actually and when I was at school I I didn't shout to the rooftops that I was a traveller um, I kept it quite secret because I was scared that I was going to get bullied um so yeah I was frightened that I was gonna get bullied for being different or you know people are gonna take um make fun of me and so yeah I did sort of keep it secret and I didn't really shout it to the rooftop to tell people so to actually witness like children saying yes I'm a traveler like I just think it is so like so lovely to see and when you speak to children or after you think this is what I'm doing it for like just making a difference and um yeah it's just such a nice feeling and 
yeah, I, I think it's great. Thank you, Kevin. And and one of the things you said there, you know, the kind of going into the schools and working with the children, I think it's it's one of the powers about the way FFT kind of work. You guys are always, you don't just create a work, but you're also thinking about the teacher's materials. Can we create films so that the the teachers or the different services can use and and so that it can have its its a life of its own afterwards and that it can really um reach a number of different parts of whether an educational system or different aspect or a cultural and arts system and i think that that's really important to to have that way of working and that way of you know putting work out there and creating work um and you know, it is, as you said, Suzanne, and all of you have touched on, you know, there's a lot of history in this show and you do cover a range and, you know, I've learned things from the show. Um, and I think that speaks to, number one, that the GRT history isn't really in mainstream curriculum, isn't very visible. Um, and also that there is a lot of um, misinformation out there because earlier you started, Susanna, by saying oral history. So there's very little that's been documented on the community. So I know that a lot of um, researchers and artists and different um, people are trying to kind of look at those gaps and fill that in. And I know certainly within the project, that's something we've been trying to do as well as reflect on those gaps and how do we bring community members into looking at that. And speaking of layers, um, we have dance, but we also have music. So, uh, Sarah Jane, maybe we can bring you in now into the conversation. Sure. Yes, hello. Yes. So, um, Sarah Jane, can you tell us a little bit about your role within the project? And okay. Yeah, um, so I joined this uh, Crystal Vado project um, fairly recently. Um, I've worked on uh, Romney Theatre pieces before with Romney Theatre Company uh, because um, uh, Part of my background is uh, Romeo Gypsy from my dad's side. Uh, and I got involved with Romeo Theatre Company initially doing stuff like this because they were looking for musicians who had a traveller background or gypsy background. Um, uh, so I did a few plays there and then a friend um, linked me up to Crystal's Vardo um, through online Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was keen to get involved um, as it's a, it's a personal thing. Um, and I enjoyed the, the stuff I did before, and I am a musician, so I do lots of different projects. Um, so, yeah, I came on having worked after a previous musician who'd already done music for the show. So I had to learn some of the same pieces, but also I brought in some new things as well. Um, so I ended up, re my background's folk and traditional music. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I had to do a bit of research and come up with some new things as well that, I didn't really know much about, and then also bring in some of my own repertoire that fitted with the piece. So uh, a traditional song um, that's now in the piece at the moment. Um, I learned from an Irish traveller singing it, um, and it fits in well. And yeah, I did know some of the things already, but also I had to create a piece of music that sounded like it might have been played at some point in like 420 AD. <laughs> No, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh it's been challenging that and it's also been fun as well. So yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask all of you if there's I mean, we already heard Susanna from the letter from the child, um, that really kind of touched your heart. But uh, any uh, um are there other moments or quite memorable moments good or maybe challenging that kind of stand out for you there might be a few i know if some of you have been doing it for 10 years um but is there anything that you'd like to share that you thought oh wow that was surprising or that was really touching yeah like there has i think there was a there was a time where i um someone brought their i think it was their horse to school was it susanna yeah um to school like to drop them to school and i think they were like um yeah just because they were so proud of oh. their backgrounds and <laughs> they wanted to like show off and say this is who i am and that was after watching the play so i think yeah it's just it's so nice to hear about 
Yeah, that, that really was that was a great story, wasn't it? It was yeah. like, literally uh, the day after. Um, the, I think that the kids sort of said to their said to their parents, you know, can we can we bring Arvado and and horse into the school? And the school were really receptive to that. So you know, have it. So having then seen the play, you know, it was then it was like, well, yeah, that was that was a play, but here is here is you know, this is it in real life. I don't think so. I think obviously did have a real impact. So that was a, a really positive outcome, I think. Um, I mean, we've had some unusual, different, weird. Um, I was just thinking about that performance we did in a prison as well, which has obviously had a very, you know, had a very, had a very different impact. You know, so you're going from kind of a school of primary school, a kind of young seven, eight year olds, and, and then going into a, into a, a category category B prison, men's prison. Um, mm -hmm. And I just remember, I do remember the first prison we went into because we've been into several now. And uh, I think, I think the, uh, I think the actors will agree. I think they were like, what, what are you, you know, they, they were terrified. They felt it was such an alien environment. Can and, I ask, can I ask, yeah. what was the response from the prisoners to the performance? And did they all stay throughout it? And what happened? They did all stay throughout it, and yet, and seriously, as one of the, I mean, the first prison that we went into, which was Morgan, it was just such, such a positive response. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, yeah, there, there was a brilliant um, uh, discussion, the, the, the Q&A that sort of like ensued afterwards, because it, it was a very, um, that first audience was very, uh, had quite a sort of a broad ethnic mix. Um, there were quite a lot. There were a lot of Muslim, Afro Caribbean, and what was great was the discussion afterwards, where where there was actually sort of like a sharing of language. So they were sort of like, you know, words. There were some sort of similar words. So it was, it was really sort of great for this kind of very positive um, discussion. And and I think afterwards, so but it was also the I think the response from the actors as well and I think you will hopefully agree with me but at the beginning they were terrified and thinking what have you brought me into why are you, have you um and sort of feeling incredibly vulnerable in this setting and afterwards saying wow that was brilliant you know they were they were so elated so elevated and, and, in, and the, the prisoners are always so respectful as well and it, it they always you know come up to all of us shake hands you know say yeah. how much they got out of it yeah, um, because, uh, yeah, just because I've I've done a performance before in prisons, but not with you guys, but with the Romany Theatre Company. I just wanted to, like a comparison thing, really. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I wonder how it went for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it it wasn't, and I know the prison officers afterwards, you know, in the feedback said, you know, they were sort of about it for days, and which was just, you know, which is great. So I think it did have a really positive. Do it. I can I tell you want to talk. <laughs> I think some of our most challenging shows have been in secondary schools, from my perspective. Yeah. <laughs> We've gone to secondary schools, and I remember the one in Chessington, um, Kavana and Suzanne, I'm sure you remember this. It was quite a while ago now. Um, and, yeah, they were very unruly, quite disrespectful. And then, Kavana, you that tore was... them off at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the, what appalled me, the teachers weren't playing ball they weren't keeping the children under control and it was a, it seems like a wasted opportunity for the children to learn that is annoying. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. um yeah the etiquette of watching a show and you know just mm -hmm. being respectful in that respect but also listening to what we were telling them you know with this history which you know has to be listened to there it's a very you know, there's lots of facts and figures and it has to you have to you know watch it you know that's what yeah. you do with it yeah. and you have to focus and they were <laughs> a challenge <laughs> so polite <laughs> a challenge yeah. 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 I think it's the formality of theatre that many young people aren't, aren't used to no, but, that's um, true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do remember sorry no sorry I was just also thinking of um, a performance that we did um, at Stony Wish it was an out outside performance which was quite a mixed audience and we had you know, I mean, again, a lot of people, you know, if you've not ever been to, I'm sure that there were people there that had never been to the theatre in, in their life. So, you know, they don't kind of understand the formality and that, you know, you watch it, sit down quiet from beginning to end. 
and I think we had dogs and children and all sorts. <laughs> I, I understand. I've taken a group of children to the theatre before for work, and um, some of them just fell asleep. They were so bored, so bored of the waiting. They just went to sleep in their chairs, really. That was it. <laughs> well, they, they didn't know. They weren't used to like the, the like what to do. So you know, when they had to wait for a long time, they're quite young. So you know, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we've ever sent anywhere to sleep, have we? <laughs> no, I don't think you would. I don't think you would. It definitely wouldn't be that. Not with that kind of thing. No, no, no. That shows too lively. Yeah. So I do want to open up the space to anyone um, else in the room if they have any questions for the 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 rest of the cast or or um, Susanna. Um, but I do have a question myself um, while others think uh, about their own questions. Um, Susanna, uh, you you know, Stuart, you just said that there were lots of facts and figures in the work, and so for you, Susanna, as the writer and director you know, how do you, were you going to different archival material? How, where were you finding this information? Because we know that there is limited information available. So, you know, if you can maybe help us understand that. So for other artists that want, or directors that want to work or create a similar piece of work, you know, what would you, what advice would you give them? Can you explain a little bit that process? Well, I mean, I have to say, like I say, the play was developed and performed in 2012, but I'd say I've started, I, it took me several years really to piece everything together because yeah. yeah. there was an enormous amount of research involved and it, it wasn't just the research, but it was also, you know, finding finding stories and finding um, that because you had to kind of see things in a dramatic context and also how you were going to weave everything together. So, um you know, obviously, I did a lot of research via the internet, but also connected with um, different different historians who, who sort of drew me to the attention of different stories. Um, for instance, Donald, Donald Kendrick with the uh, the book um, around the Holocaust. Um, Robert uh, Robert Dawson, who um, who who um, gave me some great stories, but you know, and then I, I did. I was sort of bringing in different people from the travel communities to sort of from the community to, to sort of help me do research. But yeah, it did it. Um, the really, really tricky bit was the because there were certain stories. I mean, like the story of Matty Cooper, the um, which I, I think I, I, um, I learned through. Um, I think it, there's um, was it the Romani uh, Romani Heritage um, an organization. Um, that, that drew me to, to the attention of that particular story. So that was a sort of a story in itself, you know. Um, and then we, and, but what was really difficult was the sort of the early history, because like I said, there was so little that was documented and a, a lot of it was sort of all slightly sort of myth, mythical, really. So, um, you know, it, it was sort of like, you, you were just sort of giving a flavour of something that happened. I mean, because there was the myth that, um that um i think it, it, the shah of persia um there were no musicians or entertainers in persia so um there were a lot of, and he heard that there were many sort of musicians and entertainers in in the sort of northern northwest india um the in the nomadic communities so they were invited um thousands of um of, of people from the nomadic communities were invited to to um to, to perform in Persia, so that was sort of a mythological, a myth, but, uh, you know, but the, it was sort of like a, a real kind of push and pull factor, you know, there were wars that were going on and, the, um, you know, it was thought that um, early um, gypsy communities were, were, were Hindu and then, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really yeah. complex history. So. Yeah. And Sarah Jane, for you, as you created the musical, uh, the, you know, you said you you created and offered a musical piece. Can you talk us through a little bit of your own process and research in creating yeah. that, please? Sure. Um, well, the musical pieces that I offered were pieces that I knew anyway um, from British Isles folk and traditional music. Um, uh, I actually went to university when I was about 26 to four years to do folk and traditional music degree um, uh, in Newcastle. Um, so a lot of 
sort of knowledge and research and just general nerdy things <laughs> have come from that time. It's quite a few years ago now. <clears throat> but um, uh, yes, so I did have, so I did know some of the pieces um, and the context in which they were written. For example, the Moving On song was written by Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger for Radio Ballads um, on Travelling People in the 1960s. And this song was put together from interviews with um, people at the time, real life people, real life situations of being pregnant on the road and um, being told to move on by the police. Um, and some people that I, I've spoken to have always thought that a traveller wrote the song, which isn't the case. It's used from traveller interviews, but it was written by a, a folk singer. So, but it's a well-known song and, you know, I, I like it. So I think it's a really good song. <laughs> that was already in the piece. Um, there's another one called What Will We Do? Um, that I learnt from um, recordings. Uh, there's a lady called Mary Delaney, who's an Irish traveller, or was rather. I don't know if she's still alive. I don't think she is, from around Camden Town Way. And um, it's quite a well known song in the folk circle as well. Um, like, what will we do when we have no money? And just basically that they'll keep going and keep going again and again. And it just um, it fitted well with getting work and earning and that sort of life you know um so there was that and also we have a, a piece that was already in the play called fish and taters that is in a collection of um songs by uh, a folk song collector called alice gillington and there's an old book that was published in 19 something can't remember the exact date uh called songs of the road there's a copy in the ralph Vaughan williams library at cecil sharp house this is how much of a nerd I am, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I used no, to work I think I it's, there for it's a year. Really beautiful to show that education officer. Yeah, and I was working with Romany Theatre Company at the same time. So basically, every book they had in the library about gypsies and travellers, like photocopy stuff on the sly. Okay, all right. Let's not because like I, I wanted to know it all, you know, because I didn't was it what was out there? What did I know? What did I not know? You know, I learned quite a lot. Of like historical stuff. When I started working with another group, um, I had to read a book um, called From the Ganges to the Thames. It's quite dry, but it's got a lot of kind of. Uh, I did. I did read that. We have, we yeah. Searching. So yeah, yeah and, and and other things to kind of like increase our own knowledge about our own backgrounds, and so we could talk about it and know about it as well as working with it. Um, so yeah, the other pieces I had to research for Greek music, twelve century <laughs> and so I did a lot of internet research and playing around and I found a few medieval Greek tunes that are used as um, circle dancers that are still played so I used one of those um, in that bit there um, in the bit earlier on uh, the northern Indian Persian scene um, I did a lot of research about instruments sounds Lightly, likely, sorry, instruments. It's quite hard to say for sure, 100%, obviously. It's all a little bit of like, well, they probably did this and it's probably like that from what people have found now. Uh, so the flute fitted well with a piece of music from then. Um, uh, so I tried to get an idea of scales, of what notes would be played and what pattern and the differences between them. Um, and then I chose one of those and tried to work it from that. I also watched some uh, film footage and I can't remember, it's obviously not real. <laughs> um, is it Time of the Gypsies or something? I can't remember. Anyway, there's this thing. <laughs> I'm not gonna be very eloquent for a moment. Um, that is a musical film. I'll have to, I'll find it in a minute. It's a musical film that follows so many people from was it La Chodrome? Yes, oh, that's it. Thank you. La Chodrome yeah, yeah. is the amazing. So I watched yeah. that as well. So after I read my stuff and got my scale organised, I wanted to watch it because I wanted to get a feel for how people were moving in this film and about dancing. So I would do it with the sound off with my scale and just look at how people were moving when they were dancing or moving and thinking about what it was like. What was the weather like? Where were people going? Why were they going there? How were people feeling? How was the community at night? And I was trying to like uh, think about things like that, and then just made it up. <laughs> sure, sure. That is the technical term. I made it up. So, <laughs> yes. sure. 
Yes, you, you offered your creative and artistic uh, voice there. That's right. <laughs> and so, you know, I see a question here from uh, Kozer who says, a writing dramaturg question. How do you embed elements of the political issues into the story? And I wonder if, um, since we've heard a little bit from Susanna about kind of the research side, maybe we can hear from the actors um, on your experience of embedding those you know, um, political issues into the story and kind of communicating and sharing them in a way that so the young people could um, take it in and have that bite sized information. So maybe you can offer your your process of working. I mean, <clears throat> basically, Henry VIII obviously has his, um, you know, he made this uh, the ruling about, you know, any gypsies found within 14 days have to be banished, this that, and the other. I mean, I make him make him fun. I mean, obviously for children watching um, younger children as well, you have to make it fun. I mean, I did theatre and education years ago when I first started out and I realised that, you know, they are more responsive to fun characters. I mean, obviously Henry VIII had a very dark side. My Henry VIII is a much more lighter character, still very stern. So the children get that he is someone that is making rules. Uh, and you know, not nice rules. Um, but obviously, I I go into the audience and I include them, so they're they're receptive to what they're hearing. But it's not obviously it's done in a you know a child friendly way. And obviously, when we uh, take the um, the play to prisons or secondary schools, we kind of change it slightly so it makes the tone more adult. But as I say, it's a very subtle kind of line to to walk because obviously. School children, you know, like seven or eight year olds are very different to 16 year olds and 16 year olds are very different to men in prison uh, and people at conferences uh, and the traveler community watching. So it's a fine line, really, I find. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Kavana, do you want to offer? Yeah, so like, like what Stuart said, really, like I try and be quite engaging. Um, there's loads of interacting with the children as well and I think that helps a lot and I do feel like when there'll be like a few scenes that are quite serious and then we'll have a scene where we sort of bring up the mo like bring up the mood a little bit and we start handing out flowers to the audience and the kids are sort of like yeah um, but yeah like I think it really helps with the interacting with the children I think they sort of stay focused and um, they listen a lot more as well because um, I think that they feel more involved in the, in the theatre piece so yeah it works well thank you can I just say yeah I mean I think that's it I mean the, the actors are so familiar with the play now which is great so they're able to kind of change change the pitch um, because you know there's an awful as you've said there's an awful lot of information to get out there and I think different things you know different aspects of the play touch people in different ways so there are things that um, but we'll go over the heads of some younger audience members, but then, you know, it will resonate more with their teachers or, or the older members of the audience. So I think, you know, rather than sort of, you know, having lots of different plays for all different audiences, I think people can kind of, you know, take different aspects from it. But I mean, I think also for it, what was quite challenging was that the second half of the play, as as Bannon mentioned about sort of serious scenes, you know, the play does become more serious. Um, and I think, but because I say the first half of the play is a lot more lively and there's a lot more sort of humor and audience interaction. So we've kind of, we've kind of like got, you know, we've almost said then got the audience in our hands then. And then it's like, okay, well now you've got to kind of sit back and there's some, Sort of serious stuff going on and I do sometimes worry you know when as as I watch when I watch the play and I think oh goodness you know this is a young audience or, or this is getting quite kind of quite serious or the tone has come right down um but then you find you know that there is so much stuff that that, that they have got and that um and yeah I mean because we do have you know so I want to kind of you know, to, um, so we, we there is an eviction scene. It's it's in it's in the sixties, but uh, you know it's not that dissimilar from from sort of situation that would ha happen now. But it just sort of gives that sort of flavour of, of you know of of the sort of the, the difficulties and, and, and the issues. 
Um, but then, as Kavana said, we do try and then bring it back, you know, because it's it is still it's a piece of theatre, so it has to sort of has to work on so many different levels, really. Yes, and you have to make people laugh in order to make them cry, to make them think. You've got to keep you're playing with their emotions throughout, really. Yeah. Um, yes. And are there any other questions from others in the room? You can use the chat. You can feel free to turn on your camera or just your audio. Any questions, comments? I was thinking before it ends, sorry, I know yes, yes, you're just ahead. waiting. I just yeah. thought I'd to say um, it might be nice uh, um, to um, show the little um, animation piece, if we can, Rosa. Yes, I can uh, do that. So I don't know whether I just. Um, so we decided to um, when we created the film, we thought it, it would be nice to create a short sort of like introduction. So it's sort of to give some context to um, to Crystal's life, because I think, as I mentioned before, um, there are so many different, um, there are many different travelers. Um, so, and and Crystal is is Romani. So it's just to sort of, just to sort of get a little bit of context for her story. And this was, um, the, uh, the animation was made by this wonderful artist, uh, Elijah Vardo and uh, narrated by the, the, the Romani poet, Rain Gagan. I was really privileged to work with both of them. Can you see my screen? I can, yes. Okay. Meet Crystal, a Romani gypsy girl. Crystal and her family are Romani gypsies and they live in a caravan, which they call a trailer. The ancestors of Romani Gypsy people lived in India a long time ago. Due to persecution and slavery, Roma people have a strong nomadic heritage. That means they often traveled from place to place. For this reason, they are sometimes known as travelers, although there are many different types of travelers. Crystal and her family live on a traveler site called Cherry Beacon, somewhere in England. Five other families live on the site, where they each rent a plot for their trailers. Crystal has two older sisters, Anna and Charlene, and a younger brother called George. George has a passion for playing football, and he is a fantastic goal scorer. Crystal and Charlene love to dance and dress up, whilst Anna prefers to read her books. Anna always has her head in a book. This is Crystal's dad, also called George. He works as a tree feller, cutting down and trimming trees. Crystal's mum, Cassie, is a florist. She makes beautiful floral displays for the local church, weddings and funerals. Crystal's granddad also lives with them, and he owns a beautiful red fardo, which is a traditional gypsy wagon. He also has a horse called Tacho, who pulls the vardo, rather slowly due to his old age. Tacho is a cob. Many gypsies have been horse traders through the ages and still go to horse fairs like Appleby where they buy and sell horses and catch up with family and friends each year. Crystal has a large loving and caring family and not all of them live in caravans. Crystal's Aunt Lulu who is a nurse and Uncle Mikey who works with Crystal's dad live in a bungalow with their dog Bartley. Gypsies and travellers live in all different types of homes. Wherever they live, whether in a house, a flat or a trailer, they are still Romani Gypsy. It is their ethnicity and culture and in their blood. Crystal and her family love to travel over the summer to different <coughs> festivals where they meet with other gypsies and travellers. But Crystal is about to begin a very special journey of her own. And we hope you will join her on what will be a voyage of discovery for all of us. Hello. 
Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. That's really beautiful animation. And it's, um, yes. And the, yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think it's just important also to sort of highlight things that, you know, because so many, so one question that the kids always ask is, is or um, is whether, how, how are you, if you don't live in a caravan, then how can you call yourself a traveler? You know, so I think it is just kind of understanding that it is, you know, it's an ethnicity, it's part of, it's a way of life, a culture, um, so that, and many travellers, um, not all travellers live, uh, you know, that are, are nomadic, or maybe they're, nom they're not able to be nomadic. I mean, obviously, yeah, there's a whole kind of, um, um, there are so many issues around that, but, um, you know, it's just to really sort of explain that it is kind of, you know, it is part of their culture and, and, and um, a way of life. And not less, but isn't necessarily on the road. That's right. That's you know, right. The traditions and um, so uh, so yes, but I mean, you know, I, th I think it's just so important. You know, that's um, it's just kind of like I, so many young people that we've spoken to, sort of over over the years and in groups, you know, that speak about how they they feel invisible in the schools and that they feel that their culture isn't being reflected. And I think it's just, you know, it's so important that really schools do start to weave the the uh, Gypsy Roma cultures and histories into the school curriculum, not just for Gypsy Roma Traveller History Month, but you know that it, it um, that the the community is 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 reflected in the school in all school um, environments. That's right, and I think that you know there's. Um... Again, I said this before, but it's so lovely the way that you guys work in creating resources that are free and available online. And you're thinking about different um, types of users, different ways that people can engage with the material. Um, and so I think that is a lovely kind of segue into uh, Yinka's comment who says, thank you all. I must go now, but I am from ICT Theatre in Brighton and would love to have the performance come to us when we have a cultural event for our students. I'm in contact with Tommy at FFT. And then we have John who says, my comment is the project is very inspirational and everything that education and engagement could should be. Congratulations on 10 years. May you continue for many more to come. Thank you for... Thank you for sharing your journey. Yes. And oh, thank you. Yes, really lovely. And again, congratulations to everyone involved. I know that all of you work very hard and have, you know, leave parts of yourself in the work, as we would say in Spanish. Um, that's a, a phrase in, in our community. Um, so thank you all. If there are no other questions or comments, um, from either anyone in the space or any of you. Yes, Sarah Jane. How do you say that in Spanish, what you just said? Eh, me dejo la piel. I leave my skin in the world. Again, again. Oh, wow. I love me that. Me dejo la piel. Yeah. There piel. is a word. Piel skin. Ah, okay. I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you leave your skin in the work and then yeah, it's there. Uh, um, that but... is literal translation. I like it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it does feel like that sometimes. Um, yeah. There is a word that you use in the when you are doing uh, when you were doing the dance. Uh, oh. The malala is it malala? Or how I can't mahala. Mahala. So mahala is the this idea of kind of community in your neighborhood okay. or your setting, and so this. Yeah, it's a it it's an old way of of kind of thinking about community. It literally means the. Um, your neighborhood, your your where you live, um, but that idea of the mahala carries you. Your community is always with you, and it travels with you. Similar to what you're saying about your life, that it's a lifestyle, it's a way of being, it's a state of mind. Um, it goes back to that. So when I teach, I try to you know really look at how we can create community with who's involved. And you know when we created the work, I had done my research about the piece that I thought we were going to create. You had specific requests, but also I asked. The dancer, the actors, to send me a video of themselves just dancing, so that I could see who was that, how they moved, so that it could really be something that we co-created. And that again goes back to this idea of the mahala and working together in your community, um, and honoring the moments. Yes. 
So Mahala, so similar to the Indian language, which is Mahul, also means neighborhood. Yeah, exactly, Kozer. It's it's a direct link to um, the Indian Roma um, historical aspect. Yeah, um, I've heard that East is like a, a a word, and like it's in parts of Europe for Mahala for like just like yeah, like neighborhood. Yeah, thing. It, it shows the Sanskrit connection. Yeah, to, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a comparison with one time a friend who speaks Gujarati. I like kind of comparing some seeing if there's any similar assuming if we can find anything you know uh between any english Romani, <laughs> this random and gujarati words and there's just like there was a couple of little things because oh, i can see how that's evolved you know mm -hmm. so it's, it's interesting yeah yes yes and then again it links back to why we need to work with you know archives and libraries and other institutions to show these connections and that it is still you know, informing creative work and that it's a living, breathing, you know, and as the community changes and evolves, so can the work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So true. thank you, everyone. I think we are on time. As always, we have um, some music as an outro as we go on our merry way. But thank you so much for, for rounding out the Capacity Building Lab Day series. Um, really so grateful to all of you and to everyone involved who's been part of the Weave Mahala and the journey. Um, so thank you and have a lovely day. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.